Thank you for coming. I, I see there are a great many people here. I suppose uh, you're all here. You're tired. You need to have an afternoon nap, and you expect me to put you to sleep. Uh, I'll, do, I'll do my best. Uh, I just hope I don't fall asleep <laughs> during my own talk. I don't want to be like the story in the story about the Duke of Cambridge who dreamed he was speaking to the House of Lords and woke up to find out that he was. Uh, uh, I'm going to be talking today about a famous book by Robert Nozick, uh, Anarchy, State and Utopia, which came out in 1974. Uh, how many of you have taken classes in... Uh, political philosophy or ethics or political theory where Nozick, his book, is studied. Or, oh, I, I see a great many. You see, in uh, as I mentioned in my first lecture, in uh, universities, to the extent that uh, libertarianism is taken seriously in uh, political theory or philosophy, it isn't as we do here. We wouldn't. They're not studying very much the works of Mises or Rothbard. They're studying Nozick's book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. So this is the book they're concentrating on. But if we look at the book, we can see how much Nozick was reacting to mer things in Murray Rothbard's book. We can see he made a very close study of Rothbard, and he, at all various times in the book, he's commenting on uh, remarks uh, Rothbard had made. I'll tell you, if I may, a rather funny story ab about them. Uh, the two of them, uh, they were both uh, leading libertarian theorists, but they didn't like each other at all. It was much more uh, Nozick didn't like Rothbard than Rothbard didn't like Nozick. Uh, and one of the things they quarreled about was in, their, in one of their first meetings, uh, Rothbard mentioned his view that you can't measure interpersonal utility. Or, uh, there's no unit of measure for utility. And Nozick was very dismissive of that. So it's perhaps a bit unusual to find two people who hate each other because they differ on whether utility is a measurable in intensive magnitude, but that actually happened. Uh, now, uh, I should tell you there are some people who don't like anarchy, state, and utopia very much. Uh, for example, if you look at the, the for a very negative view of Nozick, not only in Anarchy, State, and Utopia, but as a philosopher, if you look at the uh, forward or introduction that Hans Hoppe has to the uh, reissue of Murray Rothbard's Ethics of Liberty, uh, Hans takes a very critical view of Nozick. He said, Nozick wasn't a systematic thinker. He didn't take philosophy seriously. He was uh, just uh, playing games. He really can't be taken as a serious thinker. Now, I think you should certainly read uh, Hans Hoppe's uh, introduction because he's a very outstanding thinker. I have the highest respect for him, and what he says is always worth careful thought, but I must say, uh, I, oh, sorry about that, I guess that was Hans uh, <laughs> coming back at me. Uh, uh, I take a rather different view. I first uh, came across Nozick's work in 1973 when uh, I read his article, uh, which was in the Personalist magazine, of, of, magazine, it's a philosophy journal, called On the Randian Argument. And then when Anarchy, State, and Utopia came out in 1974, I was up a couple, I was up all night 
reading the book, and it has fascinated me ever since. And so I, in the uh, 45 years that I've been studying the book, I must say I, I don't understand it very well. I know a little bit about it, but I always find uh, material that uh, is new material. Now, one thing uh, to understand what's going on in the book, uh, I think it's essential to know uh, Nozick was an extremely fast thinker, and he goes over, he was extremely, he was one of the best, probably the best at objections to arguments. He could always think of a counterexample, whatever anyone would say, he would have a counterexample. If you remember, you see, I said, whatever anyone would say, he would have a counterexample. This applied to his own thinking also. He would always have counterexamples and possi new possibilities, even on things he'd said himself. So when he was writing, he would have to bring it to a stop. He'd have to stop at some point because he would just, otherwise he would just keep coming up with objections and new points indefinitely. Uh, this is a point about him, uh, his f friend uh, Tom Nagel, who is is rather a rival to Nozick in some respect. They were also great friends, at least until uh, Nagel's famous review of Anarchy, State, and Utopia called uh, Libertarianism Without Foundations appeared. After that, they didn't speak for many years, but then they eventually reconciled because they were both ganging up on a different philosopher. <laughs> but So we have to realize Nozick was always coming up with new points and objections, and he's very hard to pin down. Uh, the book is actually very systematic. It's not disorganized, but one thing Nozick did when he was writing was he would, unlike uh, writers who make it easy for you where they state their basic ideas and then summarize the main points, he would often put up, put in essential points just in one or two sentences and then expect readers to remember them through the later parts of the book. And he really, ex he would keep asking all sorts of questions and he expected readers to try to answer the question and try to work out the, uh, what he was saying for themselves. Uh, now the fundamental principle in the book he states earlier is that individuals have rights and there are things you can't do to the individuals without violating these rights. And uh, this leads us to ask, of course, what does he mean by a right? Uh, it's very difficult to come up with an exact definition of a right or even one that's a definition that's even approximately correct. But one point is that if you have a right to something, then uh, you're at liberty to use force to defend yourself against those who take your, try to take your right away or would violate your right. So uh, if, some, if you have a right to your property, you can use force to resist those who are trying to take over, to steal from you. Uh, this is uh, for Nozick, and also is true for Rothbard, uh, political philosophy is trying to figure out when is force or the threat of force justified. This is the fundamental question. It's not part of of, of total part of ethics. It's just part, this part of ethics, the part dealing with when people may justifiably use force or threaten to use force. Uh, now, I want to spend some time on a key notion in understanding 
rights that Nozick uses, which what, what he calls side constraints. Uh, what he means by this, uh, this, we have to see, he starts from the point that individuals are separate beings. Each of us has our own life to live. And he contends that their views, contrasting views to his own, such as utilitarianism, that don't take seriously the differences between people. Now, utilitarianism, as you know if you've taken philosophy course, is the view that we're trying to maximize happiness, the greatest happiness principle. We're trying to maximize, say, a population, what will produce the greatest happiness. We shouldn't say greatest happiness or the greatest number because that gets you into different problems because you're trying to maximize two uh, magnitudes at the same time and you'll get into big difficulties there. So let's take utilitarianism just to mean the greatest happiness over a certain population. So what Nozick says is, well, on this principle, uh, we could make some people sacrifice, we could sacrifice some people to make other people happier. I mean, supposing we find, say, somebody is a real pain in the neck, is always causing trouble, like me, for example. We could get, say, getting rid of me would make everybody else much happier. Of course, I would have to, my not wanting to be gotten rid of would have to be taken into account, but this could be swamped if many people were happier with my demise. Won't have to wait that long anyway. But uh, so, what is wrong with this, according to Nozick? Uh, what is wrong with this way of thinking? Uh, well, Nozick says this is, and here he's following uh, John Rawls, and Rawls wasn't the one who uh, originated this criticism either, but here both of the famous uh, Harvard philosophers, Rawls and Nozick, who are usually often opposed, were agreed on this. They said, if you reason in that way, then you're acting as if there's a single entity, collective entity, and uh, you're, make, you're making uh, the whole entity better off by sacrificing part of the entity, the, the pers one person is being sacrificed for the whole entity. He said, this would be, say, say you have an individual, say, we have a case like this, uh, you're going to the dentist, and the dentist is giving you some very painful procedure, so you say, well, I'm going to sacri sacrifice this, uh, undergo this pain because it'll make me better off in the long run. Of course, people who think that way don't know dentists very well, but they don't know the drill. But, <laughs> sorry about that. But, oh, I have many worse than that, I guarantee you. Uh, but, so here, it's a single individual, and the individual is, it, it makes perfect sense for the individual to say, I can give up, sa sacrifice some part of myself. Say, imagine uh, we have another case, say, doctor says, I have to amputate your arm so that you will live. It makes perfect sense for somebody to sacrifice part of himself for his own total welfare, but this isn't the case for uh, sacrificing some individuals for uh, the whole society because there isn't a collective entity that's, whose welfare is being maximized. There are only individuals, no success, so we can't reason in this way. So these rights are what he calls side constraints rather than uh, maximizing principles. Uh, what he means by this, he took this from uh, side constraint was taken from certain work in uh, in building uh, computers. I think where uh, 
a side constraint is a restriction on how the machine operates. It isn't, a, it isn't a, in, in other words, the machine has to function following these constraints. It's something like a rule in the game. I mean, supposing, for example, you were playing chess, as I say, as, uh, and you say, well, uh, according to the chess rules, I, I can only move my pawn one or two squares, but I don't care about that. I'll forget about that. I can win the game by moving it in a different way. You can't do that in this in this game and say, well, I'm just going to balance uh, uh, observing the rules against my own uh, uh, my own advantage and try to come up with a, some kind of maximizing move in that way. Sometimes there are some games where people do that. For example, in I think in basketball, people will deliberately foul others, which is a violation of the rule because they think they can get some advantage in doing that. But in, in a side constraint, you, you don't view the rules in that way. So if you take side, a side constraint, you write, you don't say uh, how can, you're not trying to maximize anything. You're just tr saying, I required because of this view rights aside constraints to uh, uh, not to violate rights. Now, an indication of how people tend to read Nozick carelessly, people will say, oh, well, Nozick says that in uh, cases, uh, I think, of, of, uh, catastrophic moral horror, then you don't have any rights. And in the passage that where Nozick is supposed to say this, he says, I hope largely to avoid this kind of complication and not to deal with this. And people will say, oh, he says, well, in these cases, then the rights don't exist anymore. And he didn't say that. So there's a tendency among many people who read Nozick I think because the book is so complicated, just to not quote accurately what he's saying. Now, uh, one thing about a side constraints view, remember I've, so far I've contrasted a utilitarian uh, view which says we're trying to, uh, uh, we're trying to promote the total happiness, we're trying to maximize happiness, with a view of we have to observe rights as side constraint. Now, you might raise this point. Well, if we're trying to, we think that it's people should respect each other's rights, we value uh, respecting rights, shouldn't we then have a principle we should try to maximize or the extent to which rights are respected or minimize rights violation. So this is also ruled out by the way Nozick takes a side constraint view. Now, uh, let me give you an example, perhaps this is a rather difficult notion, but let me give you an example. Uh, in the uh, uh, Roman Catholic Church, when people, uh, been I've been told this by two of my great friends who were uh, Jesuit priests. Uh, it's absolutely forbidden under any circumstances for a priest to violate the secrecy of the confessional. This is absolutely ruled out. You just can't do it. Now, supposing the following case came up. So you can see... Uh, violating the secrecy of the confessional is viewed as a very extremely negative value. This is really bad on this view. Now, suppose a, a priest confessed to another priest 
that he regularly violated the secrecy of the confessional, and he wasn't sure that he could, uh, he could keep refraining from doing it in future. He would do his best, but he just wasn't sure he could, uh, he could do it. So uh, supposing the, you might think, well, if what's important is to stop, is to prevent uh, priests from violating the secrecy of the confessional, maybe the priest should turn the other one in because otherwise if he doesn't, it's likely that there'll be a lot more violations of the secrecy of the confessional. And uh, what you're, you view this as a really, a really bad thing. So wouldn't you try to not uh, to stop that by uh, turning the person in? But this is not the way it's taken in the Catholic Church. You couldn't violate the secrecy of confessional even then. So it's a side constraint. It's an absolute restriction on what you can do, and it can't be turned into a maximizing view. Uh, there are a couple footnotes in the book where Nosey considers various complicated ways where somebody could try to turn this si absolute side constraint into a maximizing view, but he thinks they wouldn't succeed. Now, we can have a further complication to this is... Uh, Supposing we had a case like this, supposing you thought of yourself, you were very likely to violate other people's rights. Say you just couldn't resist stealing from people. You know, say you saw uh, someone had left uh, his car key, car unlocked. You couldn't re resist going in and seeing if there was anything you wanted inside, inside the car. So, supposing you, you thought uh, you know you're going to keep violating people's rights, so and you want to minimize rights violation. So, supposing you thought, well, if you steal something very openly or do something that violates somebody's right, then you'll be sent to prison, and there you won't be tempted to violate rights because you say you don't think you'd be very successful in trying to uh, deal with the other prisoners. So even in this case, if you take a side constraints view, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't violate somebody, somebody's rights, even if it would minimize your own rights violations. So uh, to some, some people, uh, to some people, this view doesn't make sense. They say, well, if you've got a goal if you, if you want something that is automatically a goal, if, say, you don't want rights to be violated, that's your goal. So it doesn't make sense to have a side constraints view. But uh, Nozick was decidedly the other way. He said, no, respect for persons requires treating them as, as, as not ones whose rights can be violated. If you do that, even for the purpose of, of uh, reducing other people's rights violations, you're unacceptably viewing them as a means rather than an end. Uh, now, in uh, Nozick's, we've talked about rights. Now, what are these rights? The rights that Nozick uh, takes are very will be very familiar to those who studied Rothbard, and I suspect uh, Nozick has taken a lot of his, the structure of his theory from Rothbard. He's also he made a very close study of Locke's Second Treatise, and he has all sorts of things to say about how very various passages could be of that book can be interpreted. But I think you'll find the whole structure of his rights theory is very similar to Rothbard. So individuals have rights, including rights over their own bodies. Uh, Nozick is really accepting what uh, Rothbard called the principle of self-ownership, although 
Nozick doesn't tend not to use that term self-ownership. He does use it at one, I think in one passage of the book, but not usually, but he accepts the basic notion that it doesn't matter really what you call it. It's the one he accepts. So uh, what he starts off with is that the, the world starts off unowned, but people have to do something to the uh, land and natural resources to acquire it. They have to do something to appropriate the property, but what they have to do, he doesn't specify, he doesn't think that uh, he has some proposals for a principle of initial acquisition, but he doesn't think he can formulate it in a satisfactory way. Uh, I'll just say there's a famous passage where Nozick says, uh, imagines this situation, he says, supposing that, uh, it, supposing you say you acquire property by mixing your labor with it. So Nozick says, well, uh, supposing you throw a glass of tomato juice into the ocean, uh, would we say you acquired the ocean by throwing the tomato juice in? Maybe we just say you lost your tomato juice. So a lot of people take Nozick to be saying he's rejecting this principle of labor mixture, he's rejecting the principle of appropriation, but he, he isn't doing that. He's just saying that he thinks the principle has to be very carefully stated. He's not that he's not giving any weight to uh, laboring on property to acquire it. And, uh, and now you might ask, uh, why do I say that's what he meant? And the answer to that is that he told me that's what he meant. So I, I take him at his word on that. Uh, now, you have, uh, remember we've said a right, you have, if you have rights, it means at least in part that you are at liberty to defend your rights against those who violate them by using violence against against your rights or threatening violence. And in Nozick's view, again, similar to Rothbard, uh, you probably would find this is very difficult to do on your own, so you would make sense to uh, join some sort of protective uh, organization, association to help you enforce your rights. You would delegate that uh, to them instead of, say, supposing uh, somebody steals from you instead of trying to catch the thief yourself, you would go to your local protective agency or association and get them to uh, deal with the matter. Uh, now, uh, Nozick now undertakes, which the principal uh, project of the first part of Anarchy, State, and Utopia, he has a very difficult project. I don't think ultimately a successful one, but he makes enormous efforts to show that he's starting off from an individualist anarchist position like that of Rothbard, I shouldn't say like, pretty much identical with Rothbard. And what he wants to show is that from the starting point, a state-like entity might justifiably arrive. So he's saying to Rothbard, well, uh, you know, you don't believe in the state, but I can show, or at least I'll try to show, that starting from what you consider the correct starting point, uh, individuals would act to their advantage in uh, the result would be a series by a series of steps. We'd arrive at something that is a state or very close to a state, and in doing so, the individuals wouldn't be violating anybody's moral rights. So he says, well, I can come up with 
some, I can show you that from your starting point, you'll get to where I want to be. You'll get from uh, having uh, anarchism, just a number of private protection uh, agencies. You'll get to a situation where there's a dominant agency which becomes what he calls the minimal state or the night watchman state. And this state has a moral duty to transform its, the, the ultra minimal state, I should say. And this ultra minimal state has a duty, moral duty to transform itself into the minimal state. Uh, so what he suggests is uh, if people are in uh, different uh, protective agencies, these agencies will very often come into conflict. Say, uh, imagine you're, uh, you are a client of one agency and then uh, somebody from a, uh, who's a client of a different agency aggresses against you. So you want to try the have the person who aggressed against you brought to trial and punished by your agency, but the other agency said, no, no, we're going to try the case. So there'd be all sorts of conflicts in this uh, instance. And Nozick suggests, well, if there are these different co these conflicts, uh, there'll be a tendency for one agency to win. One agency will be better at uh, winning these conflicts. And if that happens, there'll be a cascading effect where a lot of, most people will join that agency because if you uh, want protection, you want to go with an agency that will protect you, is more likely to protect you, will, that will win these conflicts. You don't want to be in an agency where you're going to lose out but then uh, he said, well, what if this doesn't happen? Then you might have, there are two possibilities. You could have a situation where one agency is stronger in one area and one agency in a different area. Uh, or now you could have, in, if this doesn't happen, all it, neither of those happen, suppose, you don't have one agency that always wins, or you don't have a kind of one agency stronger in one area and one other. Then you could have kind of a balance where uh, the agencies don't really uh, neither one, none of the agencies has superiority over the other. So then he says, well, then in if effect they make some sort of agreement on what to do in cases of conflict, so that they'd really be part of the same agency. So you'd really just have one uh, dominant agency because they'd all agree on an appeals procedure, what would happen if the agencies come in conflict. Now this is, I must say, it's a rather odd claim. I mean, why, suppose you had an appeals procedure, why would that make them one agency? Uh, Supposing you could Im imagine cases where they're completely separate, but they just, just decide to hire independent uh, arbit arbitrators to settle disputes between them. It seems that Nozick is really trying to here pull a bit of a fast one and just defining this situation as one of a single agency. And it's a bit ironical. There's one footnote where he quotes Rothbard is saying he thought it was likely, Rothbard thought it was likely if agencies conflicted, they would have an appeals procedure and then there would be, kind of, he thought there would be likely they'd agree on a kind of a stop at two levels up in the appeals. And Nozick said, well, uh, Rothbard says this, but he doesn't come up with a real argument that that's necessarily what was going to happen. But Nozick himself had suggested they'd come up with an appeals arrangement which would make them one agency. So 
I think Nozick is here giving his own, he's attacking Rothbard for what, in fact, his own pro, his proposal. So uh, I think this is a bit unfair on Nozick's part, but as I've told you, uh, he really hated Rothbard, so maybe that was why he didn't, he didn't notice the problem there. Uh, so, supposing though Nozick was right, let me put this objection aside, uh, even if he was right, we would have just a single dominant agency. We just have, say, uh, most people are decided to join this uh, protection, particular protection agency. Uh, why would that be anything like a state? Now, here is where the Nozick gets into an extremely complicated argument. As I mentioned, he's trying to show that this dominant protective association or agency would transform itself into what he calls the ultra-minimal state. And then once it's in the ultra-minimal state, it's morally obligated to transform, to transform itself into the minimal state. Uh, so now what happened, now we'll get into the complicated argument. The part so far that I've given the lecture is the simple part. Now we're getting into the really good stuff, the complicated part. Uh, so suppose someone violates your rights, say uh, someone, uh, someone steals your wallet when your just comes up, steals your wallet. Uh, what can you do about it? Well, uh, you're, er, you're entitled to compensation you're entitled to get back what the person has stolen. And if this isn't available, you're entitled to the value of what the person has stolen. Now, the question Nozick raises is, is this always enough? Now, people have often misunderstood Nozick. Uh, you find uh, this is really, uh, really quite amazing the way Nozick has been misunderstood here. People will say, well, Nozick starts off with this extremely strong view about rights. He says rights are side constraints. You can't violate people's rights. They're absolute or near absolute, maybe in situations of catast catastrophic moral horror, we would have to, we might be justified in violate in uh, the rights would lapse, but otherwise the rights are absolute. So he starts off with this, but then he says, okay, you can violate somebody's rights as long as you compensate them, meaning you return them to the same utility level that they have before. Uh, Nozick, uh, when he talks about utility levels, he talks about indifference curves, which, uh, as you all know, Austrians are not indifferent to the use of indifferent curves. They don't like them at all. But that's not really central to the argument. So people say, well, look, Nozick really abandons his belief in absolute right because he says that all you have to do is return the person to the same utility level. And there are very good philosophers who take Nozick this way, for example, Eric Mack, but it's a misreading of the book. And it's ironic that some of the people who use this criticism against Nozick, I remember uh, George Smith, who is a leading uh, libertarian philosopher. Some people may know him for his, uh, he's written on uh, free thought, and he was involved with the uh, objectivist Nathaniel Brandon for a long time. He's one who raises this criticism. And it's ironic because in his own view of punishment, he favors a pure restitution theory where if you violate somebody's rights, what you have to do is give back just what you've taken. So uh, it's odd that somebody would criticize Nozick for abandoning rights in favor of returning people to the same utility level when the person, him, the critic himself, 
favors a pure restitution theory. But the misunderstanding is Nozick is not arguing that all that compensation is enough. He, he, in fact, he goes on to argue that in most cases, compensation isn't enough. So it's odd that people say, well, Nozick is saying uh, he's reducing rights to just the right to be at a, a certain utility level when the point of the whole point of this complicated chapter is we're talking about now the f chapter four of the book. Chapter four and chapter six are probably the most difficult in the book where it gets the most complicated. But what Nozick is saying, compensation is normally not enough but there are some circumstances which it is. Now, what does he mean when he says it's not enough? Uh, well, uh, he, I should say first, why isn't enough? Well, supposing uh, he's asking question, he's not saying you're free to violate rights, but what happens if you do violate rights? Suppose, again, suppose I steal your wallet and you say, uh, and then uh, let's say I, I have to give you back the money, uh, or why or why isn't that why isn't it enough that I give you back the money? Or let me give you a better example, a uh, much better example. Supposing a, a business man wants to build a, a building that needs. Uh, your property in order to complete his building. So he says, well, I'll give this person the full value of their property, the market value of their property, and then I can just take it over and they're no worse off than they are before. They get the full market value of their property, but now I can use it for my purposes. So one problem here is... Uh, Supposing I had to buy the property from, from the person who owns it, then you might, the person might ask for more money. There'd be, uh, if I say I'm in an exchange with you, we know from basic Austrian principle, we both benefit from the exchange. If I exchange apples for oranges, we both benefit uh, from the exchange, but we can ask their gains from trade. So generally, er, er, almost all, I can't say to you, well, I'm going to take what you have and just return you to the same utility level you were on. You're not any worse off, but I'm better off. Why can't I, I why don't I have to uh, bargain with you so that the benefits from trade don't go nearly all to me. Uh, why don't we have to bargain for this so you get at least more of the benefits? So this is you. Uh, you might uh, you should uh, you might be able to get get the right only if you paid more compensation wouldn't be enough. And now there's another problem is one that's key to his argument, is fear, uh, certain kinds of fear. Supposing, he says, supposing you know somebody in your neighborhood is going to break your arm, so in future he's not going to tell you when he'll do this, but he's going to, somehow he's going to go around breaking, yet breaking your arm, you would feel fearful about that even if you knew that you'd be compensated for it, would just you just get it, be afraid of that. So even if you were compensated, you would still be fearful. Now you might say, well, then you could just increase the compensation payment so to take account of this fear, but then knows it, as you'll expect has another complication. He says, supposing that it was known that this policy would be applied to a lot of people, and anyone who was uh, who was uh, whose arm was broken would be compensated. But 
some people's arms weren't broken. They would still feel, feel fearful, but they wouldn't be compensated. So uh, Nozick suggests that if certain kinds of rights violations or th risk of rights violations arouse fear in people, compensation isn't enough. You would be able to prohibit these activities, and by prohibit, he means come up with some additional penalty besides full compensation. And now I'll go through very rapidly, because I'm running out of time, how this applies to the minimal, the ultra minimal, the dominant agency. He said, well, uh, people might be afraid that agencies would, other agencies would impose uh, unreliable decision procedures on them. I mean, supposing, uh, say, an agency had a different view of requirements for fair trial from your agency, supposing, say, an agency just required an, uh, a jury vote of majority vote rather than a unanimous vote to convict you, uh, people, you might feel fear that other this agency would, if they were in a dispute with you, would subject you to penalties and you'd be afraid of that. And even if they, that didn't happen, you'd still be fearful. So Nozick thinks you can prohibit that in the set, the agency could prohibit that in the sense that they could, in, they could uh, say, if you do this, we'll impose some further penalty rather than just full compensation. Now, every, everyone has this right, every agency, every person has the right to, according to Nozick, to prevent this kind of decision procedure, unreliable decision procedures from being imposed on them. But the dominant agencies, you will win in cases of conflict. So, he says, well, then the dominant agency will get its way and then it will be pro able to prohibit other, agent, other people for, from imposing decision procedures it doesn't approve of. So then if that happens, uh, well, other people have been, inde independents have been uh, deprived of the ability to enforce their rights, say that people aren't clients, they've been deprived of the ability to enforce their rights. So they're owed some sort of compensation for that. But this is since, uh, for uh, various complicated reasons, this this isn't a case where they're, they're uh, required to have much compensation. They only get very limited compensation, and the compensation consists of getting a low-cost uh, protection policy from the dominant agency. So it's, uh, the, if you don't like the dominant agency, the, you don't want to get involved with it, you get as a special benefit, you get a, a protection policy from the dominant agency it doesn't seem like very much compensation so it's uh, it's really if we go through this in detail we'll re we really see the enormous effort to which Nozick has to resort to avoid accepting the uh, individualist anarchist perspective of Rothbard and I think it's a tribute to Rothbard that even someone of knows its extraordinary, extraordinary intelligence and ingenuity wasn't able to pull this off. But the book is well worth very careful attention. I hope I'm eventually able to understand at least a little bit of it. Uh, thanks very much.